Hello everyone, I'm sure you've heard about the deaths caused by invasive group A streptococcal infections in the UK. Why is this happening? Could this happen in other countries and what can we do about it? Well, part of the reason is certainly the fact that we've just been through several years of social distancing, restrictions and isolation. Of course, the primary intention was to limit the spread of COVID, but as a side effect, we also limited the spread of other viral and bacterial infections. As a result of this, millions of people weren't exposed to infections that they would have been exposed to in a typical year. And as a result of this, the collective immunity to various infections gradually dropped. But now, with all the restrictions almost completely gone, Pandora's box is wide open again and all infections are free to circulate just like before the pandemic, only now they have this somewhat more vulnerable population to spread through. And we can see the results everywhere. It's not just about strep throat. Other bacteria and viruses are wreaking havoc all over the place. For example, RSV is causing more infections than ever and the hospitals are filled with children with bronchiolitis. And once influenza is in full swing, it's likely that this problem will become even worse because influenza predisposes patients to severe streptococcal and staphylococcal infections like bacterial pneumonia and empyema. And when a certain infection becomes several times more common than normal, the number of bizarre or unusually severe clinical presentations will also become much higher. The good news for now is that there is no proof that a new, more virulent strain is causing all of this. It seems like the same old strep, the same strains we are all used to, only more widespread than in a typical year. So okay, what does this mean for us as clinicians? Should we be more aggressive in treating strep throat? Should we be more liberal in our use of antibiotics? Well, the vast majority of cases of invasive streptococcal disease have absolutely nothing to do with strep throat. As you all know, strep throat is most common in children between the ages of 5 and 15. And it's extremely rare in patients over the age of 65. It's virtually non-existent. With invasive disease, it's the exact opposite. It's most common, by far, in people over the age of 65, people with chronic conditions like diabetes, like malignancies, and by far the most common source of invasive streptococcal infections are skin and soft tissue infections, not strep throat. Strep throat, in fact, is for the most part a self-limited disease. Actually, every now and then an article pops up where the author suggests that in industrialized countries, we should maybe even abolish routine treatment of strep throat with antibiotics simply because serious complications are so rare. Now, I wouldn't go that far, but the very fact that this idea even exists illustrates the point. For the most part, strep throat is mild and self-limited. That being said, invasive streptococcal disease can, in very rare cases, develop as a consequence of strep throat. It is possible. And a steep increase in the number of cases of strep throat and scarlet fever among children, like we are seeing in the UK right now, inevitably leads to an unusually high incidence of invasive disease among children as well. And if you see a single case like that over the course of your entire career, you need to recognize it right away, because if you don't, the consequences will be devastating. So let's see what invasive disease looks like so we can recognize it and treat it in time. All the news articles and video reports I've seen on this topic mention fever and malaise as the first potential signs of serious illness and okay, yes, this is how it starts, but really, how does this help? Most people with strep throat will have a fever. Look, it's right there in the centaur criteria. They will also feel and look pretty sick. So fever in itself definitely isn't a reliable marker of serious illness, but signs of organ dysfunction most certainly are. So whenever you have a patient with suspected strep throat, with any kind of streptococcal infection, with fever in general, always look for signs of complications. If you've seen my free online course on recognizing serious infections early, you know that I repeat this ad nauseum. Take this minute, literally a minute, to closely inspect your patients to assess their vital signs and take a close look at their skin. 
specifically in streptococcal disease. On the skin, you might notice this characteristic rash of scarlet fever. It's always described as reddish with the sandpaper-like feeling. Now, this is nothing to panic about. You will treat these patients like you would any patient with strep throat, only know that scarlet fever is extremely contagious and this rash will actually help you in getting the right diagnosis right away. Also on the skin, you might notice in severe cases, in sepsis, invasive streptococcal disease, you might notice generalized redness. In more advanced cases, you might notice that the skin is mottled or cold, clammy, especially on the extremities. In this case, you, your patient will probably show many more signs of organ dysfunction like altered mentation, respiratory distress, something like that. Now, if you've seen my courses and other videos, you will know that I always mention respiratory rate as a very early and sensitive marker of severe illness. Increased respiratory rate will appear usually much earlier than hypotension or other signs of sepsis. So please, take literally 30 seconds to measure your patient's respiratory rate. And don't fool yourself. Don't think, oh, I will notice if they are breathing rapidly. Yes, you will if their respiratory rate is 50 breaths per minute. But if it's 26, you probably won't notice. I wouldn't, honestly. And this is paramount because many patients with invasive streptococcal disease present with absolutely no localizing signs. They just present with signs of organ dysfunction. So they are septic, but you don't know what is the source. About 10 to 15% of patients with invasive streptococcal disease will also develop the dreaded streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, a devastating disease where a large quantity of toxins produced by the bacteria flood the bloodstream and unleash an even more powerful and devastating dysregulated inflammatory response, leading to a rapid progression to shock and multi-organ failure. Without prompt resuscitation and immediate antimicrobial treatment, patients will progress into refractory shock within a couple of hours. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, if you see a patient with fever and hypotension, of course you will suspect sepsis. But the reason why it's important to consider streptococcal toxic shock syndrome is that in addition to your empiric therapy for sepsis, there are other drugs like clindamycin and IVIG that can help patients with streptococcal toxic shock syndrome and you will not apply them if you don't suspect that this is it, right? So if you see a patient with rapidly progressing hypotension and signs of any kind of infection, ask yourself, could this be streptococcus? And then actively seek signs of streptococcal infections like a sore throat or a skin and soft tissue infection or even bacterial pneumonia with empyema. Also, ask your patient if they're conscious or their caretakers, parents, anyone, was there anyone else in the household who recently had strep throat or scarlet fever or any kind of streptococcal infection? Ask about recent influenza or chickenpox because these two viral infections predispose patients to streptococcal complications. For influenza, it's usually bacterial pneumonia with or without empyema and for chickenpox, it's cellulitis, right? People scratch these blisters on their skin and this causes streptococcal cellulitis. If you've seen my uh, video on chickenpox, you will remember that cellulitis is by far the most common complication of chickenpox, especially in children. Patients with toxic shock syndrome often present with a sudden onset of fever and vomiting and sometimes even diarrhea, so they get dehydrated very quickly. Now, vomiting and fever are by far my least favorite symptoms in the ER. Because uh, if, you, if the patient comes in right away, so if they've only been sick for a couple of hours, you cannot know what this is. It could be simple gastroenteritis or it could be sepsis and anything in between. So don't guess, it's impossible to know what it is every single time. Admit your patient for observation for a while. You will recheck their vitals periodically every half an hour or so. Perhaps you will order some tests and you will quickly see where this is going. If this is something like streptococcal or meningococcal sepsis, this will become apparent within a couple of hours and you will be able to react right away. And if it's a child you're treating and you see that the parents look especially worried and distressed, if they tell you that something is really wrong with their kid, that the kid is unusually still, passive, drowsy, 
take this very seriously and consider more severe disease. Also, one of the things that patients with overwhelming sepsis often report is severe limb pain. And they often feel like they're about to die. They literally have this feeling of impending doom. I already talked about this in my video on meningococcemia. But regarding the pain, many invasive streptococcal infections like necrotizing fasciitis begin with excruciating pain in one of the limbs. This pain is present way before other local signs like uh, skin discoloration or edema appear. So again, if you have a septic patient with this excruciating pain in one or more limbs, you have to at least consider invasive streptococcal infection. After discussing all of these systemic complications, don't forget that patients with strep throat can have very severe local complications that you should look for, like abscesses, peritonsillar abscess and deep neck space abscesses. So whenever you have a patient with a fever and a sore throat, make sure you take a couple of seconds to actively look for signs of local complications like neck pain, impaired movement, a swelling on the neck, and especially signs of respiratory compromise, of airway obstruction. None of this should be present in uncomplicated pharyngitis. I talk more about this in a separate video. You can find the link in the description. And finally, when you send your patient home, perhaps with antibiotics, which you usually will, make sure that they understand what to expect, what is normal and what isn't. With antibiotics, most patients will feel a lot better already within 24 to 48 hours. If there is absolutely no improvement by then, make sure that they understand that they should come back for re-evaluation. So when you put all of this together, we just need to be careful and thorough, but not paranoid. Whenever we have a patient with a fever or a sore throat, we just need to take a minute to look for signs of potential systemic and local complications. That way we will notice patients who are seriously ill and we will be more confident in our decisions. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.